Welcome to the Moral and Translation Superiority of the New World Translation Part 2. Christologically Significant Texts in John. And if you've watched Part 1 of this series, then you know that we're dealing with differences between the New World Translation and primarily English translations, most of which are the product of Trinitarians or Trinitarian Bible Translation Committees. And in part one, we showed how the New World Translation was not only superior in its inclusion of the divine name nearly several thousand times, 7,000 times, I should say, in the Old Testament, where the Old Testament text has the divine name, but where Trinitarian Bibles almost never use it. So it's translationally superior there and morally superior, as we showed in particular with regard to the New International Version, where we read a letter from one of the members of the committee, Edwin Palmer, who explicitly stated that the reason they didn't use the name, even though they should have used the name, was because of money and tradition. So there's a moral difference there. It's not just an inability to recognize what's in the text and translate it according to the best available evidence. Money and tradition at times get in the way with doing what people can see should be done. It wasn't like the NIV or even other Trinitarian Bibles that fail to use the divine name where it should be. It's not like they just are unable to see what they should do. Many times they do see what they should do, but they don't do it. And in the Bible, if you know what is right and you don't do it, it's a sin. It's a moral failure. And so what's interesting is with the New World Translation, it's often the object of attack, primarily by Trinitarians, who claim the exact same things that we're talking about and have talked about in part one, that the New World Translation is not only translationally inferior, but that it is morally inferior because the New World Translation is often said to be biased, that its doctrine, the doctrine of the Watchtower Society is getting in the way, that they know what they should do, but they don't do it, or that they're just not capable of recognizing what's in the text. It's incredible how backwards things have become. The Trinitarian scholars have failed in such obvious and critical respects with with respect to several significant texts as we're going to see just in the book of John, but in other books as well. It's embarrassing. It is a humiliation for how much they have failed, not only with the divine name, Thousands, thousands, thousands of times they have failed to recognize and represent the God of the Bible. But they do so for the sake of money and tradition. They do the same thing, certainly because of tradition, where it concerns several Christologically significant texts we're going to talk about right now. In the, go- in the Gospel of John specifically, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 8.58, and John 10.33. I'll do another part in this series where we talk about similar translation and moral failures in Trinitarian Bibles in the letters of Paul. And we'll talk about other translation differences between the New World Translation and Trinitarian Bibles and other English Bibles later on. But today, we're going to focus on those three texts from John, three texts that come up quite often and that to this day, in spite of all that I've written, in spite of all that the Watchtower Society has provided in in justification for its translation of those texts, and in spite of what others have written and presented to show that their translation is probably the best, and I'm going to argue is the best. In John 1, 1, John 8, 58, and John 10, 33, in spite of all of it, those who believe in the Trinity 
can't bring themselves to accept reality. They not only continue to ignore all of the grammatical and semantic information that we have presented and that is there for anybody who wants it, they continue to attack translations that get it right, like NWT. It appears they're just too beholden to the Trinity. There's too much to lose. There's too much at stake. You see, they have condemned Jehovah's Witnesses in the New World Translation so badly at this point to back down. It's a humiliation. It's a catastrophe for Trinitarians. And there's really no easy way out of this because they can no longer justify their translations. They can no longer justify their doctrinal creations which they continue to place over the clear and obvious meanings of the biblical text that we're going to consider. Let's go to John 8.58. We're going to start there. We'll read a little of the context, and then we're going to go to John 1.1, John 10.33, maybe in reverse order so that we can all see how Jesus himself defines what he means when he considers himself theos, a god. First, though, John 8, 58. Is the New World Translation just so terrible that it can't even get Jesus' words, ego and me, right? Is that really the case? We've got people like Dr. James White. We've got people like Robert M. Bowman Jr. We've got Trinitarians all over the place constantly claiming NWT is inferior in John 8, 58 because it doesn't use I am. I'm going to show it's exactly the opposite. That translations that use I am are showing they don't understand the Greek text as good as those who handled the NWT. It doesn't matter how many degrees. You could have a thousand different degrees in languages, including Greek, if you translate John 8, 58, as before Abraham came to be, I am, you don't know Greek. Or you're so biased and beholden to post-biblical doctrines, you can't bring yourself to translate Greek. Let's take a look. Let's see whether or not the NWT in John 8.58 is inferior or superior. Because all over the place, these Trinitarian scholars, right? The learned people. No one questions that, right? But we can question whether or not they're right when it comes to the product of their learning. Right? If you have so much knowledge, Trinitarian scholars, what's the problem with your learning? Why can't you apply it right? Let's take a look. Let's put John 8, 58 into the light. First, let's read it in context. Then we'll discuss the grammatical issues. Then we'll talk about who has translated it, how and why, and what the grammars has, have had to say on these issues. Because if you look online, and you pull up John 8, 58, it's universally condemned by Trinitarians, the NWT's translation of John 8, 58, and yet it is superior. They are inferior. They just can't bring themselves to humble themselves because of all their learning, all the condemnation and hate that they have been burning with when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses. It's disgusting when you consider what they have done and the lies that they have spread, not only over John 1.1, 1, 1, we'll get to it, but John 8.58. Starting in verse 53, reading the NWT, the Jews state, You are not greater than our father Abraham who died, are you? Also, the prophets died. Who do you claim to be? 
Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. Trinitarians, is Jesus God? Then why is his glorifying himself nothing? It is his Father who glorifies him. He, this is Jesus talking about someone else, the Father who glorifies him, the glory that actually means something, since his means nothing. He who you, you Jews, who worship the God of the Bible like I do, he who you say is your God. Trinitarians. Did the Jews say their God was a trinity? No. No, they didn't, did they? And that's why Jesus right here, instead of making it clear like you want to hear, that the God they worship is him, or at least him and the Father and the Holy Spirit, no, he differentiates his glorifying of himself with the glory of the Father. And he says, the Father is the one you, the ones I'm talking to, say is your God. That's the one who we say is our God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, one God, the Father, Trinitarians. Stop adding to it. The Jews, according to Jesus, believed the Father was their God. Right after Jesus differentiated himself and the glory of himself with the glory from the Father who is their God. And yet you have not known him. They know him as their God, but they don't know him because they don't know he sent Jesus as the Son of God. I know him, and if I said I do not know him, I should be like you, a liar. Notice Trinitarians, they have not known him. The one who they said was their God is a him, the Father, one person. Like Galatians 3.20, one person. Like 1 Corinthians 8.6, one person. And it's not including Jesus. It's the Father. But Jesus knows him. And if he said he didn't know him, he should be like them, a liar. But he does know him. Not a what, Trinitarians. Not a one what. A him. The Father. The Son knows him and is observing his word. Abraham, their father, your father, talking to the Jews who claimed his God, their God, the Father, rejoiced greatly in the prospect of seeing my day. And he saw it and rejoiced. Therefore the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty, and still you have seen Abraham? So where are we at this point? Jesus is referring back to Abraham, right? And he's contrasting Abraham, who got it right, with the Jews who are getting it wrong. The one they claim is their God, the Father. They don't know him the way Abraham knew him. And looking forward to the day of the Messiah, the prospect of seeing his day, he saw that day and rejoiced. And that made the Jews say, you're not 50. And you've seen Abraham? Right? So the Jews recognize that Jesus is telling them he saw Abraham rejoice. He says it right here in his own voice. Abraham rejoiced when he saw my day. He saw it and rejoiced. The Jews realize what he's saying. Well, wait a minute. You're not even 50. Abraham was a long time ago. How have you seen Abraham rejoice? Answer, most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. Or as the Trinitarians repeatedly mistranslate this text, I am. 
And it says, they picked up stones to hurl at him, but he hid and went out of their temple. Then about 10 verses later, in John 9, 9, a blind man uses the exact same expression, egoi me, used right here at the last part of John 8, 58, but translated, I have been. And that's because... In John 8, 58, egoi me, unlike in John 9, 9, or John 8, 24, or in John 4, or in John 6, or in John 18, where Jesus is using egoi me like the blind man in John 9, 9 to introduce himself as the Christ, whereas the blind man is introducing himself as the blind man they're seeking, it's connected with an expression of past time. And that changes things. That is now making ego e me a present, present verb, a me, a part of a well-known Greek idiom that the Trinitarian scholars with all their learning, all their Greek education, all their degrees fail consistently to understand. That is an embarrassment. That's a humiliation. And they're going to wear that all the way to the end. Their horrific translation of John 8, 58 will stand as a monument to how bankrupt their translations are when it comes to Christologically significant texts. They absolutely mistranslate John 8, 58. They fail to recognize a well-established idiom that in this article right here, I show several translations that get it right and grammars that support getting it right. It's called the New World Translation Footnotes to John 8, 58, January 13, 2010. And I list here eight grammarians, eight Greek grammarians, that Trinitarians almost never discuss or present as supporting this idiom being what I said, a Greek present with an expression of past time, which gathers up the past to the present, which is appropriately represented by before Abraham came into existence, I have been. The only way I am would be correct is if you mean by that the same thing. That his existence extends from the past to the present. But it's not proper English. We don't talk that way. We use a perfect instead of a present to represent that type of expression. J.A. Bengal, Naman of the New Testament, Volume 2. A. Thala, Commentary on the Gospel of John. H.A.W. Meyer, Critical and Exegetical Handbook. To the Gospel of John. G.B. Viner, a grammar of the idiom of the Greek New Testament. This link is in my description below. You can look up all these sources so that you know. The New World Translation is not only correct, it has the support of at least eight Greek grammarians. F. Blass, A. De Brenner, and R. W. Funk, a Greek grammar of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. I'm the only one or the first one. Jason B. Dunn, afterward, after reading my discussion of this text, also noted this. And, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn other than to, to just say I'm correct and to point out, since there's a mistake that needs to be highlighted, that I found out because I looked it up and I looked at it carefully. When I read this grammar, I noted that in, in their discussion of this idiom, they cited it incorrectly in the De Brenner Blast de Brenner and Funk, a standard Greek grammar used in many Greek grammar grammatical courses. They incorrectly cite it as John 5.58, and that's why a lot of people missed it. But when I went to look up John 5.58, I realized there is no John 5.58. They meant John 8.58. So this is one that actually... A lot of people before me didn't notice. I didn't notice anyone who had cited this grammar in support of the idiom that's underlying John 8.58 and the New World Translation of it. But Blas, De Bruner, and Funk also cite John 8.58, just erroneously as John 5.58, as representing this idiom. 
Ann Turner, A Grammar of New Testament Greek, Volume 3, Syntax. J. N. Sanders and B. A. Maston, A Commentary on the Gospel of St. John, according to St. John. Kenneth L. McKay, the most recent, Time and Aspect in New Testament Greek, Novum Testamentum 34, His Grammar, A New Syntax of the Verb in New Testament Greek, and I Am in John's Gospel, Expository Times 10710. Trinitarians, have your scholars and your apologists told you about this? No, they haven't, have they? Robert M. Bowman tried to talk about some of these citations and explain why he thought they were incorrect. He did the best job, at least, of representing the Trinitarian position, but he failed completely to justify the Trinitarian position and to show that John 8.58 is not an example of this idiom. It is. And in my writings, I showed that it is. I dealt with every single issue raised an argument presented by Bowman on this issue. And no one has responded to me on these issues. Yet you Trinitarian apologists and scholars keep running around on this issue and lying to everybody, crying that the New World Translation is not fair, it's not correct, it's biased, wrong, wrong, wrong. All of those things apply to you. No matter how much learning you have, you have failed completely to deal with these issues. We have not. We took up your challenge and we dealt with those issues. You have not. In my third edition, in my chapter on the preexistence of the Christ, and in this section, the preexistence of Christ in John 8, 58, this is my third edition. I recommend, I put links below where you can get it. You get the second and the third edition, the digital versions at least, but you can still get a hardcover printed copy of the third edition because they each contain mostly the same, but some additional information. For example, in this uh, chapter, in my third edition, I deal with a lot of different arguments, including those by A.T. Robertson viewing a me as absolute, right? They think that ego and me and Johnny 58 and Bowman believes this as well, that it's just absolute. It Meaning by that, it's a self-contained expression. Before Abraham was or came into existence, I am. Meaning either that he's claiming to be the great I am, which is a joke, right? Because there one is no great I am. That's based on another mistranslation from Exodus 3.14, Echia Asher Echia, which doesn't say he's the I am. At best, even if we give you I am, it's I am who I am, which is a statement about his character and what he will be as the sign. I talked about it in my text reading on Exodus 3.14. So you'd have to be blind to continue to use Exodus 3.14 which is mistranslated just like John 8.58 to help maintain this false connection between an I am that does not exist. It's talking about his character and what he will be as the sign going forward with Moses to free the Israelites. That's why the Septuagint translates it ego e mi ha on, not ego e mi, ego e mi, I am, I am. You Trinitarians have failed in some of the most basic Hebrew and Greek grammatical ways. Again, it's embarrassing. At this point, it's an embarrassment. And you should be embarrassed. You should apologize to the New World Translation Committee. You should apologize to every single Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door for condemning their translation of John 8, 58 and Exodus 3, 14. Ego e me is not absolute in John 8, 58. It's a part of the idiom that those eight grammarians I just referenced identify it as a present of past action still in progress. Some call it different things, a durative present or other terms that essentially denote the same thing, which means it's an extension from past, like McKay defines it, an extension from the past time in which he existed to observe Abraham rejoicing at his day all the way to his moment of talking with the Jews. That's why Ain was, won't work there. Because it's not just talking about him in the past. It's talking about him in the past and how in the past 
He saw what Abraham did so that in the present, he could tell him about it. And so you Trinitarians go from one bankrupt argument to another, all to try to sustain a connection that does not exist. There is no I am. There's no I am in Exodus or in John. I am either introduces an understood predicate, being the equivalent of an e who, right? Who? He. Who's he? You get it from the context. The Christ, son of man, one born blind, or the one who existed before Abraham, the one whom Abraham looked forward to seeing, the Christ, the Messiah. That's the day that Jesus is talking about, the day of his coming. Abraham looked forward to that day. He saw that day and rejoiced. How do I know? I was there before he was even born. And I'm talking to you right now to tell you what I saw. So they're just wrong. They try to claim it's absolute, meaning in their view, eternal, which wouldn't have to be the meaning, even if it is absolute. I talk about it in these writings. So if you want more We're not going to get into everything, but you should get my discussion in my second and third editions if you want more. I get into everything, but we will talk about a few things. So all of these grammarians who are Trinitarian like Robertson, and they don't deal with the idiom, and they either recognize it and fail to accept it, or they just don't, they don't recognize it, right? They think it's something totally different, either absolute, meaning he's eternal, which is not what he says there, and which contradicts other explicit texts in the Bible, John 5, 26. Or they claim that I am is a name, right? If you go to the Bible Hub and you pull up John 8, 58, or just many English translations off your shelf, you're going to see that they talk about it being a name, right? Some kind of title. And so it's ridiculous, It's not a name or a title. That would be incorrect English and even incorrect Greek, like I talk about in a note and like others discuss, and which I mention here. Let's read note 107 on page 277 under the extension from past idiom, which is what's in John 8, 58. Some Trinitarians seem to view ego me as an absolute expression denoting eternal existence. We just talked about it. As well as an actual divine name. Robert Morey, Trinity Evidence and Issues. You can see my debate or listen to it in the playlist on the channels, on the front page of this channel. Claims Jesus used the divine name ego me in reference to himself. But Barnabas Linders, the son of man in Johannine Christology and Christ in the Spirit in the New Testament, in honor of Charles Francis Digby Mullay, points out that Egoimi in John 8, 58 cannot be regarded as a title because it requires the meaning I am in existence. To illustrate, this is me talking now, we would not say in translation, before Abraham came into existence, Jesus. Or before Abraham came into existence, God. Does that make any sense to anyone? Yet that's exactly what they're telling us when they claim I am as a name for God and Jesus used it in John 8, 58. Before Abraham came into existence, I am. That's, that's like I am as a name, right? If it's not existential, it's ridiculous on its face. It's not how we translate. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense in Greek right? Because that's not how names are positioned. You don't say, you don't attach a name to an expression of past time apart from any other qualifiers. Missing from both is I am, which is the very expression believed by Maury to be a divine name. In other words, he'd have to be saying before Abraham came into existence, I am, I am. Ego me, ego me. Like I was talking about in Exodus 3.14. But neither one of them do that. They miss everything. All so they can try to sustain a connection. To help prop up their post-biblical doctrine. Because there is no connection. 
I go on and discuss different examples of the idiom, the extension from past idiom. I reference and discuss a lot of the scholars that I list right here, the grammarians and others that accept this idiom in John 8, 58. This is a good article. I linked it below. Now, I have another one. I have several other things I've done on John 8, 58 that I had uploaded on my topical index on the old Elihu Books website, but it's not there now because I had to remove that topical index, but they'll be back up either on the Elihu site, the new Elihu site, or on another website that I'm working on soon. So if you see any links in any of my blog articles or other writings that aren't active right now, just check back. They'll be active again, and I'll go back through and I'll replace those links with where the material is now. Here are numerous translations. I list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine translations that render John 8, 58 similar to NWT and don't use I am the way many Trinitarian Bibles do. George R. Noyes, the New Testament, before Abraham, before, from before Abraham was, I have been. The 20th century New Testament. Before Abraham was born, I was already what I am. And in another edition, the 1904, I was. And again, I don't think that's the best way to render this, but they're closer to NWT. And these are some of the older ones, a little bit more recent, Moffat. I have existed before Abraham was born. Clyston Lilly, I am here and I was before Abraham, right? That's a better attempt to use I am in a sense that relates it to the past expression to gather both up to show Jesus continuing existence from that time, from before Abraham. It's not eternal. It doesn't make him eternal. It just makes him someone who existed before Abraham was born. That's it. That's all the context and explicit terminology used there allows. Anything else is read into it. He doesn't just say, I am, right? If I am was a self-contained expression, Trinitarians, meaning I'm eternal, well, then why say before Abraham was born? Why not just say, I am? If the Jews say, well, how have you seen Abraham? You're not only 50. You're not even 50. He could have just said, ego me. I am, right? means I'm eternal, according to you, Trinitarians. Self-contained expression denoting eternality. No, it doesn't mean that, right? <laughs> And it clearly doesn't mean that by being attached to an adverbial expression that only goes back to a time before Abraham, not just eternally, like Bowman tries to argue. <laughs> William F. Beck, I was before Abraham. Kenneth N. Taylor, this is a living Bible. I realize not all of these are the most well accepted. Again, they're very available. And... Um, it's not like the living Bible is always wrong. And it's not like these are bad translations, right? These are credible scholars who at least have enough Greek to know more than the Trinitarians do who fail to translate John 8, 58 properly. Even the living Bible gets it right, Trinitarians. The living Bible is superior to the NIV and the NASB, except for the NASB in a couple editions. In the note, does put, I have been. <laughs> Richard Lattimore, Four Gospels and Revelation. I am from before Abraham was born. C.B. Williams, one of Dana, Man Dana and Mantis, or at least Mantis teachers in Greek, I believe. Uh, the New Testament, the language of the people, 1986. I existed before Abraham was born. Kenneth L. McKay and his new syntax of the verb. I referenced it earlier in defining the idiom. But he actually translates it in his grammar, I have been in existence since before Abraham was born. Trinitarians, do you know about these translations and many more that could be cited to show I am is not the only one out there and it really shouldn't even be out there. It's a terrible translation. It's inferior to the New World Translation. Watchtower and Bible, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society produced a superior translation to all these Trinitarian scholars and Bible committees. It's embarrassing when you consider how condemning they have been to the New World Translation. 
I go on and on. I discuss all these things. Here's where I talk about the different grammars that I just showed in my blog article that were listed. I talk about different texts that Bowman brings up. I talk about how there are actual parallels in the Old Testament that show that the translation of John 8, 58 in the NWT is correct. I consider, for example, how Bengal, one of the scholars I cited earlier, cites Proverbs 8, 25 as a parallel. And I believe it's perhaps the most significant parallel because it's not only dealing from the exact same section of Proverbs 8 where wisdom is talking, whom the New Testament identifies as Jesus. Jesus himself does it in Luke 11 and elsewhere where he quotes what is said by wisdom and identifies wisdom as himself. I believe Proverbs 8, 25 is the most significant parallel to John 58, not only because it uses the past expressions before the mountains were set, before all the hills, with a present verb, right? That's the idiom. Past expression, present verb, extension from past idiom that all these Trinitarian Bibles fail to get right, or they fail morally and see it right and refuse to do what's right, just like they did with the divine name. Also, because the one begotten is none other than Jesus, right? Wisdom. <laughs> and then I go on to show... I cite the section of my book where I point out the different parallels in the New Testament. I have a whole blog article on my Watching the Ministry blog with a chart that shows numerous parallels between Jesus and wisdom of Proverbs 8. But it's very clear that the idiom here in John 8, 58 is an extension from past, a present of past action still in progress. And if you want my complete refutation of Robert M. Bowman Jr.'s Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus Christ, and the Gospel of John on this subject, get my second edition. Get my third edition. It's all there in detail. Numerous other parallels from the Old and the New Testament. I deal with Bowman's responses to some of those parallels. And nobody has given me any credible response or even any response that I'm aware of to date, right? And we're about 20 years and counting. And yet you all continue to condemn the New World Translation, you Trinitarians, like we haven't written anything. We have. You're the ones who need to start writing. And don't just start writing, right? Anyone could do that. Do you have any credible arguments or not? Are you done? I think you're done. So stop lying to everyone. It's time you try to undo some of the horrific damage that your translations do when it comes to John 8, 58 and your translation and moral failure to translate John 8, 58 according to the very easily identifiable idiom. So easy to identify that not only eight separate grammarians notice it, not only do numerous English translations notice it, but the Watchtower Society whom you deride and make fun of noticed it. And yet none of you did. Or if you did, your moral failure is in not accepting it. It's one of the other Trinitarians. Which is it? Did you notice the idiom and fail to accept it and translate it properly? Moral failure. Or did you not notice the idiom and fail to translate it properly? Translation inferiority. John 8, 58. As far as why they picked up stones to stone him, I talk about it again in both of those editions and elsewhere. They tried to stone him when he agreed he was the Christ before the Sanhedrin. They will stone you, not just if you claim to be God, <laughs> but if you claim something blasphemous like being the son of God as a man whom they don't even think is 50 years old. And you say that you've seen Abraham. You can't see how they would see that as blasphemous when they say Abraham's their father. 
and they say that he's demon-possessed, and then he says he existed before their father, someone who they think is demon-possessed. You Trinitarians fail in so many ways because of your later doctrine and your loyalty to things that are not in the Bible. And at this point, right, it would require humility on your part, something in the Bible to accept what you have done and what you haven't done and apologize to everyone. John 10, let's start in verse 32. The key is verse 33. This is another text where the Trinitarians have failed to translate one of the most easy to translate terms, theos. It's either God or a God, most always, except maybe a couple times where you you might try to use contextually to say it's divine, but even that would be a quality associated with someone who's a god, or in a figurative sense, like one's belly, right? So, but it's basically a god or god. And all of these arguments that they put forward, whether it's Harner or Hartley or Wallace or Bowman, to try to transform (laughs) the argument into one where just because it's placed before the verb, they us, makes it somehow not definite or indefinite, is ridiculous. I talked about it in part 12 of the Bible and the Trinity in Conflict. And in my second and third editions extensively, I dealt with all the arguments extensively. Take a look if you want more information. But it's a joke. They've run us through all these grammatical and educational hoops so they could try to keep people in the loop that they want you to follow, Trinitarianism. It's all about reading Trinitarianism. I showed that by going through Harner's article, by going through Hartley's thesis, by going through Wallace's writings. It's always them reading the Trinity into the Bible. And they try to justify it with these ridiculous grammatical arguments that no one but them accepts or uses. That I know of anyway, Right? No non-Trinitarian is out there running around, running around claiming that an anarthrous predicate nominative preceding the verb makes it qualitative. Right? It's just emphasizing the noun. A predicate noun describes the subject. You don't, you don't need to have it be qualitative to do that. It's a noun. It's describing him as a god or god, a god, and that gives him the qualities of the noun. In this case, we can see Jesus tells us exactly what he means by that noun and the qualities associated with it. John 10, 32, Jesus replied to them, again talking to the Jews who are his enemies at this point, I display to you many fine works from the Father. For which of those works are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, We are stoning you, not for a fine work, but for blasphemy. Even because you, although being a man, make yourself a god. Now in Trinitarian Bibles, they translate a god here as God, capital G-O-D, just like in John 1.1. We'll get to it in a moment. You'll see. And I talked about this and John 1.1 also, in addition to part 12 of my Bible and the Trinity in Conflict, link below. In my John 1, 1 made easy video to show how it's so simple. We don't need all these grammatical rules and arguments and incorrect categorizations of nouns. All to try to avoid the teaching of the text. Jesus is a God. He's a God exactly like he says right here as one of the sons of God. Look at it. Jesus is answered them. This is his answer, Trinitarians. I told Dr. White this during our 2003 debate. I proved this is how they viewed it in pre-Christian texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Melchizedek Scroll, in my part four of Michael and Jesus as the Biblical Archangel, which I clipped and put up earlier today. The understanding Up until this point of Psalm 82, what Jesus is quoting right here is that the sons of God are gods, not human judges 
And even if that is who they are, Jesus is using that for his defense. And it would have to mean then that he uses God in the same sense that those gods are gods. But it's not talking about human judges. That's the later Jewish and Trinitarian understanding because they reject the Jesus of the Bible. They reject his open and explicit argument in his own defense, which we accept that the sons of God are gods. Bowman tries to argue, and I refute him both on the singular and plural usage, that it's only the singular use of theos that we should be using to try to determine what Jesus means. When Jesus himself uses the plural in response to the singular, theos, again, they reject the Jesus of the Bible. They reject Jesus' own argument from the Bible. Quoting Psalm 82, 6, Is it not written in your law? I said, quoting his father, showing again they don't know him. You are gods. Jesus goes on in verse 35, If he called gods bowmen, he's using the plural bowmen in response to the accusation of the singular bowmen and Trinitarians. If he called gods those against whom the word of God came and yet the scripture cannot be nullified, do you say to me whom the Father sanctified and dispatched into the world, you blaspheme because I said I'm God's son? What does Psalm 82 say? You are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. Just like Jesus says right here. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, don't believe me. Let's go to Psalm 80. We're going to read Psalm 80, 7, Psalm 80, verse 7, through Psalm 80 through, 7, through 17. I've done this before. I've proven not only that the Dead Sea Scrolls show the gods of Psalm 82 are spirits. They're sons of God. The sons of God are gods. That's what that idiom means, Benai Elohim. It means you're members of the category, God. You're gods. They're even called gods numerous times, Psalm 8, 5. And yet the Trinitarians refuse to accept biblical theology, biblical monotheism, one God the Father, many sons of God who are gods. There's no compromise. There's still one God the Father. But they're gods as sons of God who represent their Father. What does Jesus say? What did he just say? Whose works is he doing that day? His Father's. What did he tell his followers? In John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's one God. The sons of God are gods, but that doesn't make a whole bunch of separate gods because they're all as gods representing their Father. Unless they're the other sons of God, like the gods Jesus is referring to in Psalm 82, who are appointed over the nations, like Satan was appointed over the whole world, the God of this system, 1, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Is Satan really living, Trinitarians? Yes. So just because he's a God doesn't make him a true God or the God like the Father that makes him the one God. He's a false God in the sense that he doesn't act like the Father. But he's a real living God, just like the other sons of God. Psalm 82. We're going to put an end to this once and for all. And I've already done it. But the Trinitarians, including White and others, if you look at my debate, and I'm going to put it on my playlist, my debate playlist in the near future on this channel, along with many clips from it, you can see that he doesn't understand what's going on. He can't understand. To understand and accept Jesus' own argument from Psalm 82 is to reject the Trinity. They're incompatible, right? Because the Trinity says there's one God and misdefines that God as three persons. When the Bible says it's one person, Galatians 3.20, 1 Corinthians 8.6, they can't have anyone else being a God 
not in any positive real existing sense. And yet what does Jesus do in his own defense against being called theos? He refers to others who are gods, plural. Psalm 82, 7. O God of armies, bring us back and light up your face that we may be saved. You proceeded to make a vine depart from Egypt. You kept driving out the nations that you might plant it. That is the vine from Egypt. You made a clearing before it that it might take root and fill the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It, the vine, gradually sent forth its boughs as far as the sea and to the rivers it river its twigs. Why have you broken down its stone walls? Why have all those passing by on the road plucked at it? Those passing by on the road, the nations plucking at the vine, a boar out of the woods keeps eating it away, and the animal throngs of the open field keep feeding upon it, talking about the nations. O God of armies, return, please. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, Israel, and the stock that your right hand has planted. And look upon the son whom you have made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire, cut off from the rebuke of your face they perish. Let your hand prove to be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of mankind, whom you've made strong for yourself. And we shall not turn back from you. May you preserve us alive, that we may call upon your name, O Jehovah God of armies, bring us back. Light up your face that we may be saved. O cry out joyfully, O you people, to God our strength. Shout in triumph to the God of Jacob. Remember now, he's been talking about how as a vine they were taken out of Egypt, driven out from the nations, how people kept plucking from it. Those passing by plucked at the vine. A boar out of the woods kept eating away. Strike up a melody and take up a tambourine. The pleasant harp together with the stringed instrument. On the new moon, blow the horn. On the full moon, for the day of our festival. For it is a regulation for Israel, a judicial decision of the God of Jacob. As a reminder, he laid it upon Joseph himself when he was going forth over the land of Egypt, a language that I did not know I kept hearing. I turned aside his shoulder, even from the burden. His own hands got to be free, even from the basket. In distress you called, and I proceeded to rescue you. I began to answer you in the concealed place of thunder. I went examining you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear you, O my people, and I will bear witness against you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. Among you there will prove to be no strange God, and you will not bow down to a foreign God. I, Jehovah, am your God, the one bringing you up out of the land of Egypt, Open your mouth wide and I shall fill it. But my people have not listened and Israel itself has not showed any willingness toward me. So I will let them go in the stubbornness of their heart. They went walking in their own counsels. Oh, that my people were listening to me. Oh, that Israel itself would walk in my very ways. Their enemies I would easily subdue and against their adversaries I would turn my hand. As for those intensely hating Jehovah, they will come cringing to him, and their time will prove to be to time indefinite. And he will keep feeding them off the fat of the wheat, and out of the rock I shall satisfy you with honey itself. God is stationing himself in the assembly of the divine one, like Job 2.1 or 1.6, where the sons of God take their place, their station before him. In the middle of the gods he judges. He had just referenced the foreign gods that his people have had to deal with. And then in judging these gods in this assembly, he says, how long will you keep judging with injustice and showing partiality to the wicked themselves? 
Be judges for the lowly one and the fatherless boy. To the afflicted one and the one of little means do justice. Provide escape for the lowly one and the poor one. Out of the hand of the wicked ones deliver them. They have not known. They don't understand. In darkness they keep walking about. All the foundations of the earth are made to totter because of these bad judgments of these gods. I myself have said you are gods and all of you sons of the Most High. Surely you will die just as men do and like any one of the princes you will fall. Who were the princes of Greece and Persia? They were the sons of God. If they were already men, what would be the point of saying you're going to die like men? There's an obvious contrast between men and the ones he's talking to, the gods. He goes on to say, Do rise up, O God, do judge the earth. For you yourself should take possession of all the nations. He's not talking about just Israelite judges. The whole context has been about Israel being plucked out as a vine from the nations, from these foreign gods, how they've been mistreated, how they've been plucked at, how a boar has has nibbled at, how they've been misled, and how God then takes the initiative of judging the counsel of the gods the very gods he warned them about up here that we were reading about, the foreign gods, the gods of all the nations. O God, let there be no silence on your part. Do not keep speechless and do not stay quiet, O divine one. For look, your very enemies are in an uproar. Who are his enemies? The nations, the gods of the nations. Who were the enemies of Michael and Daniel? the gods of the nations. Only Michael would stand with Israel against those gods, against God's enemies. And the very ones intensely hating you have raised their head against your people. They cunningly carry on their confidential talk and they conspire against your concealed ones. They have said, come, let us efface them from being a nation. Who's talking here? The gods of the nations, the very gods, God goes in and among and judges for these very things they're doing to his nation, conspiring against his people, lifting up their heads against his nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. That's what they're doing. That's what he's judging them for, for motivating these nations over whom they are gods against his people to do these things. Look, for with the heart they have unitedly exchanged counsel. Against you they proceeded to conclude a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and Philistia together with the inhabitants of Tyre. Also, Assyria itself has become joined with them. They have become an arm to the sons of Lot. Due to them as to Midian, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the torrent valley of Kishron. They were annihilated at Endor. They became manure for the ground. As for their nobles, make these like Oreb, and like Zeb, and like Zeba, and like Zaluna. Sorry, I have a little question mark there in this uh, transliteration. I may have gotten that incorrect. All their dukes who have said, let us take possession of the abiding place of God ourselves. Israel, right? It's what all these nations and gods of the nations are conspiring to do. Oh my God, make them like a thistle whirl, like stubble before a wind like a fire that burns up the forest and like a flame that scorches the mountains. In just that way, may you pursue them with your tempest and may you disturb them with your own storm wind. Fill their faces with dishonor that people may search for your name, O Jehovah. 
Oh, may they be ashamed and be disturbed for all times, and may they become abashed and perish. Anyone who reads the context of Psalm 82.8 and thinks it's talking about Israelite human judges rejects the context of Psalm 82.6 and Jesus' own argument from it that the sons of God, the gods of the nations, that he entered in among and took his station and judged them for all the things they were doing to conspire against his nation and for failing to judge the earth properly does not understand the book of Psalms does not understand these gods at all. And if you don't want to believe me, just watch the clip I put up earlier from the Melchizedek scroll that shows how the Jews during the time right before Jesus understood this psalm, which is exactly like I'm explaining and like I've explained all along like I told Dr. White during our 2003 debate, debate, and like he could have looked up on his own if he cared in the first place, to see it's talking about the spirits, the spirit sons of God. Jesus used this text about those gods in his own defense about people who accused him of being theos, So even if you couldn't understand from what the Jews were saying that he made himself a God because of what he was saying, being the son of God, in their view, a son of God, all you have to do is look at Jesus' own response and use of Psalm 82 to understand how you should translate John 10. Yet Trinitarians fail in almost every single one of their Bible translations of this text to render a basic noun theos for one of the sons of God who is one of the sons of God who is a theos, a God. Hence the plural gods, theoi. Okay, you understand there's more than one God when it says they oi. And you understand that those are sons of God, sons of the most high in Psalm 82, where it uses gods. And that Jesus is being accused of being a son of God. He's claiming to be a son of God right here. So how could you possibly fail, Trinitarians, to translate theos a God right here? In John 10, 33, you do that because of your moral bankruptcy and your blind loyalty to the Trinity, which tells you he had to be claiming to be God because you reject not only the sons of God as gods, which is clear from Psalm 82, Psalm 85, and numerous other texts, or the Melchizedek scroll, you reject the very argument we use to defend our translation of this text by the Son of God. You Trinitarians are blasphemous in the way you handle this text. You either are incompetent in spite of all your great learning and you can't even figure out how to translate one simple noun with all that learning and with such an obvious, explicit context to use, right? If you're not sure, right, God or a God, oh, what does the context say? Gods? He's claiming to be one of those gods or like those gods, or at least if those gods can be called gods, then he can too. It must be a God. He's a son of God. He's not claiming to be God. You are. You are all mistranslating this text to either show you're incompetent, no matter how much learning you have, or you know, with all that learning, what you should show 
in translating this text, but your moral failure, your bias, your doctrinal bias, the very thing you accuse the New World Translation of, is what is your sin. It's what you're guilty of. You've gaslit everybody except us. You have gaslit millions of Trinitarians into believing it's us who are incompetent. It's us who have this doctrinal bias. And so we create polytheism. No. You know who teaches what you would call polytheism? The Son of God. Gods. Plural Trinitarians. Do you know what a plural is? Oh, okay. Then stop accusing us of polytheism if it's that's bad in the sense that the Bible, the Son of God and God, His Father, the one you claim as your God, but you do not know like the Jews who rejected everything we've just showed, was taught by the Son of God. You're just like them. You're just like them in all these very same ways where you distort the things the Bible says and you claim you're so learned You've studied at the schools. You've got the degrees. What do we know? You know what we know? How to show what should be translated and rendered in this text that they were accusing him of claiming to be a God because he was claiming to be the Son of God. He wasn't claiming to be God here. And even if the Jews misunderstood him to mean that, he clarified it. He quoted a text that uses a plural for other sons of God. That's exactly what we do. We're just like the Son of God. You're like those who reject the Son of God, and that's because you do. You absolutely do reject the biblical Son of God. And you run to the creeds and the councils that were overseen by an idol-worshipping emperor, and created a whole new metaphysic in direct defiance of the metaphysic in the Bible that the Son of God is a copy of God's being. The character tes hypostaseos, Hebrews 1.3. That's your metaphysic. You reject that metaphysic and instead you take a metaphysic from hundreds of years later that rejects the unipersonality of God as one God, the Father, you make that into three persons and you claim they're all co-equal sharing in the substance of the one what, when it's really a one who. And the Son is a copy of the one who, not the one what. That's what you do. That's what you have done. And you have lied to everyone. There's no excuse. Right? I agree. You're not stupid. I, I, I think some of you act stupid. And a couple of you, maybe, a couple of you uh, display unusual symptoms. But most of you are pretty smart. Just like these Jews who rejected Jesus were really, really smart. But they rejected Jesus. It didn't matter how smart they were. It only mattered what they wanted to believe. And that's why they were blind, even though they could see. And they couldn't even listen to the argument from their own texts. Just like you. Just like you who translate these texts and you can't figure out what to do with them next. As long as it agrees with your creeds and councils, your later beliefs, that's all you care about. And that's why your translation is inferior. That's why it's morally inferior than the New World Translation. Let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1, the last text of our Christologically significant texts from John. We'll talk about others in another part to this series from Paul. We'll do one on Paul. We'll talk about Romans 9.5, Colossians 2.9, and Titus 2.13. But I wanted to focus on these three texts from John. John 8.58, John 10.33, John 1.1. 1, 1. Three texts that come up often and that could be used to sh so easily show the pre-existence of Jesus as the wisdom of God as the one who was with him before the mountains, before the hills, in the beginning with God, as a God, not in a polytheistic negative sense like you Trinitarians want to use, 
The Bible doesn't talk about it that way. It just says sons of God. It just says those sons of God are gods. And then says there's one God, the Father, that his loyal sons of God are to us when they're God. His most loyal son says that most explicitly of all, John 14. We don't need these later doctrines. We don't need the Trinity. You do. I don't know why. And I even try to accommodate those of you who lie and claim the Bible teaches it because you've been abused. You've had these scholars abuse you and your pastors abuse you, not physically, mentally, spiritually. You've been abused. You've been lied to and gaslit so badly, it's abuse. Yeah, members of the Watchtower have been too in other respects, but not these texts. No. No, accepting the New World Translation as morally and translationally superior does not require us to accept everything else in the society that's inferior doctrinally. We can use the New World Translation. We should use the New World Translation because it's better than your translation. And we can show it. And you know it. And yet you keep gaslighting people anyway. That's a moral failure on your part. John 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. How many gods are there, Trinitarians? One. We know in the Bible that's the Father, and we know that to you that's more than one person. He's with that God. And as I showed in my part 12 of the Bible and the Trinity in Conflict, in my John 1, 1 Made Easy video, you redefine that God to be a person of God. You absolutely torture this text. You do all the things that you talk about us doing, twisting it, mangling it, abusing it. <laughs> That's you. All of you Trinitarians who aren't abused, right? if you've been abused by these scholars and theologians who know what they're doing, we'll give you a little bit of a pass. But once you know what they're doing, you better get past all the abuse and start believing in the text. The Word was with God in the beginning. Well, who's the God in the beginning? In the beginning, God existed according to Genesis 1, right? He was talking to others. His sons let us make man in our image. Job 38, 7, the sons of God were there. John 1, 1, the Son of God was there with that God, not a person of God. There's a huge difference, Trinitarians, between being a person of a one what and being that personal who, not a what. And that's what you do. You transform the who into a what and then you make the father a person of a what and then you say the son is the word, is a person of God with that person of the one what. None of that is in this text. I went through it all in those two videos I just referenced. The Word was a God. He's not the same God He's with. You've created so much confusion. Not only with your I am, which doesn't exist, which is a mistranslation of John 8, 58 and Exodus 3, 14, whether you see it as a name or as a self-contained expression denoting eternity, it's a mistranslation. You've confused everyone into believing something not taught in these texts. You did the same thing with John 10, 33. You failed to read the context of Psalm 82, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Melchizedek Scroll, and Jesus' own use of the plural they oi in response to the accusation he claimed to be a singular they us you do the same thing here you have the word with the god hatheos tantheon as a theos yes as i explained in those other two videos on john 1 1 just because the article is used doesn't require it is a god god can be referred to as just they us, when it's understood, that's who it's referring to. But here, John starts out and makes it clear there's a difference. There's a difference, and he makes that difference clear, whereas in other texts, 
It's not talking about two gods with each other like it is here. And then right again in the next verse, he says, this one, this theos, not a person of theos. That's Trinity stuff. That is not what is taught here. That's not the meaning of theos. We'll talk about that more in a moment as I emphasize your moral breakdown and failure here. This one, that theos, was with God, the God. So they can't be the same God, not just the same person, which you take to mean a person of a one what? Right? To you, a person, a separate person, isn't a separate God. To hear in this text, according to John, they're separate gods. There's no other way to sensibly read this text. Especially then when you get to John 10, and in his own defense, Jesus uses the plural for the sons of God, one of which he is. It's so clear, my friends. It's so easy to translate and interpret. But when you're complicated with a later doctrine and you're under threat of heresy by those who believe that doctrine, that's when you have all kinds of problems and you have to completely abandon the text for what's next. And that's why we keep arguing with all these Trinitarians who've either been gaslit or they just are lying to everybody so they can preserve their doctrine and their position in place that makes them a lot of money. It does. It's about money and position and prestige. Otherwise, they'd be like me and you and just teaching the text. Right? We don't have anything to benefit from this. Did the Watchtower have anything to benefit from this? No, they should be given credit for standing up and saying, you know what? These texts say this, right? We may not get all this chronology or prophecy right, but we can see this, right? This is obvious, right? That We don't need the Trinity for this stuff. We just need the text. We just need basic understanding of Greek grammar. And other texts like John 10, 33, where the Son of God makes it even more clear for us. Let's take a look at someone else who didn't have very hard of a time with this text. Let's look at Origen. He wrote a whole commentary on John. And while the Trinitarians messed with a lot of his stuff, like Rufinius, <laughs> and of course we don't even have most, if any, of the writings of Arius, right? Because just what they quote from him, they're so bothered by other positions, right? They just want, it's just confirmation bias run amok in many cases. Look at what Origen says, Trinitarians. I quoted this to Bowman in our 2003 debate. Yet no one really brings it up. They keep bringing up all this qualitative stuff that we've refuted and shows is nuts. Right? It's just like the most extreme attempt for Trinitarians to run into their their grammatical tower and try to hide behind all their education and big sounding words and complicated arguments so people think, oh, oh, you must have it right. No, no, they don't. They've got it really, really wrong. And they have all along. Look at what Origen has to say of all people, right? Someone they like to refer to at times, but in other cases claim he's a heretic, like Dr. Mori did at times. Look at what Origen wrote in his commentary on John book two. I'll put a link to this below. To such persons, we have to say that God, on the one hand, is very God, autotheos, God of himself. He doesn't need to be God because of someone else, like the only begotten God, John 1.18. You can see my part 18, or part 16, Bible and the Treaty and Conflict series on that video. I didn't include John 8, uh, 1.18 in this series of John texts for this series about the translation and moral superiority of the NWT because there's a variant there between huios and theos. So I may get into words like madaganes later in this series, but I only wanted to deal with texts that didn't have variant issues. But the, the oldest reading of John 1.18 goes to this point of origin that the Son is God because of someone else. He's an only begotten God. And even since the sons of God are gods, 
even using Huios in John 1.18, only begotten son, shows he's an only begotten God. The sons of God are gods. John 10, 33, Psalm 82, all the texts we reviewed, and more. You can read about it more in my two editions, second and third. The first edition will be available a little later, and then there's discussion in that as well, or other writings and videos that I've done and other people have done to show clearly, according to the Bible, and early in texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Melchizedek, Melchizedek Scroll, the sons of God are gods. It was well known. The Trinitarians just reject that belief. They reject the Son of God's argument. They reject what Psalm 82 teaches. And they run to their later doctrine, which is all they care about. And so the Savior says in his prayer to the Father that they may know thee, the only true God. That's what Origen is defining as atotheos. But that all beyond the very God is made God by participation in his divinity and is not to be called simply God with the article. Like in John 1.1. 1, 1. Not like in, he can be called God with the article when he represents the Father, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, like John 20, 28. Just like he says right before that in John 20, 17, he's going to his God and his Father. Well, that's who he is in John 20, 28. That's why he told them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In that sense, of course, he can be called God with the article. That's not what Origen is talking about here in his commentary on John 1.1. 1, 1. He's talking about the God that the word is with. Ton theon ha theos. In the same context, he's differentiated from the word without the article. Not in a separate text where he may be called God with the article because he's the father to us but when he's distinguished explicitly from the Father, the God he's with for us, the Father is the God with the article. Those who are made God by participation in his divinity are called God without the article. Origin almost 2,000 years ago was teaching the significance of the article and not having the article as God where you're distinguished from each other. He's, this is his commentary on John 1.1. 1, 1. And yet Trinitarians have been confused about this or they're just morally bankrupt and refuse to recognize, right? It's one or the other. They're either incompetent in spite of all their learning and can't recognize the difference that's been here the whole time and that people like Origen have commented on a long time ago, and instead they create all these incorrect grammatical arguments to try to make people think that it's qualitative in a way that, treat, that translates to Trinitarianism. It's ridiculous. And thus, the firstborn of all creation, and who is the first to be with God and to attract divinity to himself, is a being of more exalted rank than the other gods. Beside him of whom God is the God, as it is written, the God of gods, the Lord has spoken and called the earth. It was by offices of the firstborn that they became gods, right? The firstborn and then the other sons of God are made through the firstborn. But he's the firstborn. Deuteronomy 21, 17, the beginning of one's generative power, Hebrew text. The beginning, RK, of one's children, the sons of God who came next. He's the firstborn, Trinitarians, in a literal sense, not your couple figurative texts. The real firstborn of God, the only begotten in the sense that he was directly made by the Father and that all the others were made sons of God through him. For he drew from God in generous measure that they should be made gods. And he communicated to them according to his own bounty. The true God then is the God with the article. And those who are formed after him are gods. Images, as it were, of him the prototype. But the archetypal image, again, 
of all these images, all these other sons, is the word of God. Right? I mean, it's like you guys pretend, you Trinitarians pretend like we have no basis in the text or afterwards for how we understand God, the sons of God, and the Son of God. You have misrepresented the Bible to millions of people. You have failed to translate John 8, 58 correctly for millions of people. You have failed to tell the truth about the New World Translation, telling the truth when it comes to the translation of John 8, 58. You've done the same thing when it comes to John 10, 33. And probably most prominently, you have lied to millions of people about the translation and meaning of John 1.1. 1, 1. You have pretended like your translation of John 1.1 1, 1 is correct and makes sense in a biblical context. And it's not, and it doesn't. The New World Translation does. It makes perfect sense, just like the Son of God does in his argument in John 10, in response to the accusation he claimed to be Theos singular, with the plural Theoi from Psalm 82. For the sons of God, who were gods over the nations, that God went in and among and judged too, because of their failures to do things so that his people, the nation of Israel, wouldn't be in the condition they were in. This is proven not only by the context that we've read in detail from Psalm 80 to Psalm 83, but also from pre-Christian evidence in the Melchizedek text. It's not talking about human Israelite judges. And even if it was, that's the son of God's argument to use the plural theoi for those judges. But that's not what it means. But even if it was, that's what he means when he is called theos. But we know that when he's theos, as a son of God, he means the same thing. That the sons of God are gods or God to us when they act as their father, just like he does. And this is where we come to the great moral failure of the Trinitarian Bibles versus the New World Translation. It's not just Trinitarians failing scholastically, either in terms of their knowledge or their bias, right? Which would be a moral failure in its own right to accept what the text says. So in one sense, we know they're getting it wrong, right? They, they got John 8, 58 wrong. They just either failed no matter how smart they are, just like the Jews failed, no matter how smart they were, to recognize the idiom in John 8, 58, or how to translate theos in John 10, 33, and John 1, 1, or their moral failure comes in in recognizing those things, but not presenting it correctly. But it also comes in where even if they present it correctly, which would contradict their later doctrinal view. So they almost can't, right? They're sort of bound to mistranslate it in order to support the Trinity. Their very use of God anywhere in the Bible for God or for any of the persons of God that's not taught the way they teach it in the Bible they have a moral failure because they're not accepting the Bible's definition of God. The Father! One God the Father. Who was the word with in the beginning, Trinitarians? Who's the one God of the Bible? The Father. You have failed not only to translate the term theos correctly, you don't even understand it correctly. Or if you do, once again, here's the problem with you. You're changing the meaning of the word God in the Bible. 
It means a separate God, an individual God. The God the Word is with as God. The gods that the sons of God are when God takes his place among the council of the gods and judges them individually as gods. Plural. Trinitarians, plural. You understand? Plural. You have failed translationally and morally because you replace the meaning of God, meaning God or a God, with a person of God. You are so biased and loyal to later doctrine. You reject the Bible and its teaching about God and the sons of God so badly You not only gaslight millions of people against people like Jehovah's Witnesses and me and other people who teach what's true about the God and gods of the Bible. You lie to people about what the term God means. To you, it means a person of God. That's not what it means, right? So even if they translate, for example, everyone, John 1, 1b, the word was with God. I talked about this extensively in my part 12 of the Bible and the Trinity in Conflict in my John 1, 1 made easy videos. Even if they get it right in John 1, 1b, for example, or any other text, right? <laughs> Titus 2, 13, if you give them that one. Even if you, no matter how you translate any text where anyone is called God in a positive sense, They change the meaning. In John 1, 1b, again, for example, it's not God, the one God, the Father, the word is with. It's God, the Father, the person of the one God. They see Jesus as God, the second person of God, with. Do you see how deep and disturbed this is? It's really bad. And I know some Trinitarians don't fully understand how bad. That's why I'm spending a lot of time and emotion to trying to emphasize all of the mistakes you have made. And I've been doing this for several decades. And you're still not accepting it. So what's the problem? What is keeping you from recognizing Jesus' argument in John 10? What is keeping you from recognizing you're substituting the word God meaning God or gods, with person of God in any text. It's your traditions. It's the same traditions that were in the way of the Jews who rejected Jesus. You're falling into the same trap, Trinitarians. And you're condemning other people who aren't in that trap. And we're still trying to help you get out of that trap. But it's not going to be easy. And I am not doing these videos to help people go and run around and argue with Trinitarians because it's not going to be easy. They're in a death spiral. They're in a spiral where their doctrine has no biblical foundation anymore. It never did. It's just now we can see it more. It's more clear now what they're doing, where they're failing with their translations and where they're word substituting. And so I encourage you not to get too caught up with Trinitarians. Some of the ones who've been gaslit, maybe you can help, but they've been abused so badly and made to think that we're confused so badly. It's going to be tough. I encourage you instead to take all this stuff, reinforce your faith, help people who are just getting their faith, just learning about some of these things. Get to them before the Trinitarians get to them. Get to them before the gaslit or people who are gaslighting Trinitarians get to them. We can still help them see clearly what these texts teach. But once you go through the process of abuse taking place, with these Trinitarians, and that's been going on for a long time, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. And so use your time wisely. 
Take these videos to help build your faith and be shielded from the lies, the mistranslations, and the moral failures in these Trinitarian translations because of their later doctrinal traditions. So I believe once again in this part two, just like in part one, it is clear that just because we might recognize, like some Trinitarians correctly recognize, that there are problems with the Watchtower Society. And many people in the Watchtower Society have the same problem the Trinitarians who believe in the Trinity do. You've been gaslit and abused badly. And I understand. We've all had measures of that kind of indoctrination that we've had to get past. Some of us just have a harder time getting past them, whether it's the Trinity or the belief that you're not that you're not to question anything from the society, that you're to completely trust them. No. No, just because they did a good job, just because they did a good job with the New World Translation doesn't mean you accept them as something we can all see they cannot possibly be. But what it does mean is simply because they may make mistakes with chronology, prophecy, and other subjects, like trusting them completely, that also does not mean that we cannot use the New World Translation and fail to recognize that it is translationally and morally superior than most other English Bibles put forth by Trinitarians and Trinitarian Bible committees. The NWT is morally and translationally superior in these Christologically significant texts in John.